All right, uh, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Briggs. I'm uh, the assistant law librarian here at the Fort Bend County Law Library. And uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, we're pleased to have Andrea Barr presenting today as part of our attorney lecture series, uh, a series that we put on uh, a few times a year. This is probably our 30th one or something like that. And Andrea's presented a few times for us. So uh, she's been very kind to us to share her expertise with attorneys and pro se's on various topics. Uh, Andrea is a, a probate litigation attorney primarily, though she does handle some other civil matters as well, appeals and so forth for its RMO, probate litigation firm. She's the managing attorney for their office here in Houston. Uh, she's been practicing that area for quite a while. I've even known her to have trials on those matters right here in the Fort Bend County Justice Center. Uh, she is uh, regularly in trial. Uh, she uh, is an active attorney in uh, giving lectures and teaching other attorneys and pro se people about various aspects of the law. Uh, she is a graduate both of U of H undergrad and uh, U of H law school. Uh, she's a resident of Fort Bend County and she's a real supporter of our law library here. So uh, really appreciate her giving the time today and she's gonna discuss trial preparation and I'll leave it over to Andrea. Hello, I have included uh, a PowerPoint. I've dropped it into the chat. Also, I did do a handout. I did a paper related to evidence as well as um, appendix with a trial checklist and exhibit list for uh, filing with the court or sending to the court coordinator as well as an internal exhibit list and um, another uh, trial proof matrix. Um, these materials I've drafted and used in trial. So I included them on the back of my paper. The PowerPoint I've included as well. Um, I'm gonna screen share so you guys can see the PowerPoint, but I've also um, shared it in the chat box. Um, so <laughs> what's enough time to prep for trial? Um, the answer is there's always never enough time, I feel like, but um, it depends on what kind of practitioner you are on what works for you. My recommendation is to calendar reminders, especially if you're using staff on when things need to start happening. So I calendar, when I once I have a DCO in place, I calendar um, 90, 60, 30 days out, two weeks, seven days, three days, depending on what deadline it is. Because, and I usually have in my calendar notes what things need to be happening or being worked on during those times. There's my background. I've included my email and my LinkedIn. Also in the paper, I've included my phone number. If anybody has any questions after the fact or has questions particularly to my area of law, um, they can reach out to me. I'm happy to help fellow lawyers navigate certain issues because I've been there. I've been practicing for 10 years now in May. And um, all of us, it helps to sometimes have a spit spitball with somebody else on issues, especially if it's something there's no case law on. So <clears throat> I think the first step in trial prep, and it's for any civil case, I don't do criminal cases, so I'm going to be talking about civil cases, is getting a docket control order or a scheduling order in place as soon as you get in a case. Um, if you're a defendant, you might not necessarily want that. Um, I like to because it puts pressure on the plaintiff. Um, on either side, I try to get a scheduling order in place because we have an end date and it puts pressure on people to settle or do discovery. So, or if you don't, if you hope they do opt, then you might not want to do a DCO. Um, so uh, you would look at the court procedures or local rules regarding um, how to coordinate a trial date. Some courts do it automatically. Um, some courts also have their own form docket control orders or scheduling orders. And the smaller counties typically, because I do practice um, all over Texas, even in the Valley, there's some counties I don't practice in <laughs> um, for certain reasons. Um, but they might have a form doc control order or they might just do a scheduling order that has just the trial date. 
and the pretrial conference. I recommend if that's a county where you have a scheduling order where it only has the pretrial conference and the trial that you do a motion for a docket control order that's more detailed and you circulate it with um, the other attorneys so that you can actually have set deadlines. There's no dispute on calculating when discovery ends under the rules. There's no dispute on when to exchange pretrial materials and when things are due. I recommend conferring, and then if they don't agree, at least um, submitting to the court the blank form for you guys to have a scheduling conference so the form can be filled out. Because you're going to have to do a scheduling conference and do trial disclosures anyway under the new rules since they've been amended. Um, so you might as well have the docket control order reflect deadlines for those things. Also, if the if you if it's a court where they don't like to sign the DCO, you can make the DCO with the specific deadlines be a Rule 11 agreement. So there's a way to make it so you have specific deadlines, but you're not having to, and you're not having to fight with the other counsel about when it is and what's happening. Also, I like to do it because there's other attorneys that like to sit on everything right before trial and walk in and hand you all the stuff. And uh, it's better to have a deadline so you get it ahead of time and you have time to do your written objections for preservation of error for an appeal. So I've included kind of what deadlines generally I include in a detailed versus limited DCO order. So most the limited one that I've seen, which I call a scheduling order, has a trial, a pretrial conference, and usually it has some language about, otherwise the Texas rules of civil procedure govern deadlines, <laughs> which means good luck, especially for pro se litigants because they don't know what deadlines to look for. They don't know about expert designation deadlines, when discovery ends, how, when discovery in plays with when, when's the last date you can serve discovery, written discovery to have the responses before trial. So um, again, I, I prefer the detailed deadlines. There might be some strategy and I've seen it where counsel or pro se litigants might want the Texas rules of civil procedure apply. <laughs> um, I've included, so Harris County District um, Clerk and the courts have a specific form DCO order. It, they have it in Word on their website. And this has been the standard order for most of the courts in Harris County, even the county courts. And um, But the probate courts, which is where I um, practice a lot in because I'm in that area of law, um, they have modified the standard DCO order and they're starting to include more pretrial deadlines in it. So I've included this, but you can go in the material, you can go online to the Harris County District Court's website under the resources and you can pull this form. It's in Word and some of the courts have modified it. You can go um, to some of the Harris County uh, District Courts and they'll have the set DCO on their website. Um, the added thing that probate is also added below the trial part is they'll put, they have a blank on whether it's a jury or bench trial um, because there are matters and that, that are tried by bench. So we might have the same um, kind of DCO and then it'll say, and, and there might even be a blank on what type of trial it is, depending on what court you're with. So these are the pretrial deadlines that I include. And I have dates in this because I actually uh, copied and pasted it from one that I had in one of my cases. Um, these are the pretrial deadlines I include in my standard DCO, which is very detailed. Um, it's, it's a little bit easier to map out when you're going to be busy. You'll be able to block out your days because you know you're going to get something. Like I have the written statements of the party's contentions and the agreed stipulations, contested issues, fact, proposed jury charge, all on the same date, along with um, some other deadlines. So the reason, and this one was a, a very heavy loaded case where I was gonna, but I, I did a lot of prep. So some of these things were done. So I knew they'd been done when I made the order, <laughs> the order but um, you wanna have these dates. So, you know, I'm gonna block out time 
the day after I receive it or two days after I receive it so that I can do my objections. Um, that's why it's important to have these deadlines, at least for planning and doing trial prep, because you can manage your time and you can also manage cl other clients' expectations. Or if you're a pro se litigant, you're gonna, you'll know I gotta take off work or I have to take a short day because you're gonna be doing a lot of work on reviewing what's been sent to you and then responding or doing your written objections. Some of these, though, you might not have- We do written. not. The pair one. Okay. We uh, finish the proposed division of assets first. So I've included also um, the motions in limine, the trial witness list, the exhibit list, and exhibits. So I have in here there to be filed with the court, but really, you have to, some of these, you have to find out what's the court's preference regarding how to give them the trial witness list, the exhibit list, and the exhibits. Some judges prefer those things to be put in a binder and given them a courtesy copy, hard copy. Some want it to be in Word so it can be modified as we go. Some want it in PDF, some want it filed, some want it sent to the court coordinator or the court reporter. It just depends. So I recommend checking their website. If it's silent, there's nothing on there about it. Then reaching out to the court coordinator and the court reporter regarding what the, the courts and the clerk, um, the court's clerk about what their preference is. And if you have a hearing like the pretrial hearing, you don't have your answers yet, I would ask then, or if you do a scheduling conference to get a trial date so you guys can work out a detailed DCO, that's when I would ask, okay, how do you like these things done? Um, in Harris County, most of the judges have that on the website or in the court procedures or in their local rules. The probate judges actually have checklists about some of the things. I would say with the sitting judges right now in Harris County, there are two that prefer paper copies. There are two that do electronic. Um, so depending on what car court you fall in, you might have to have three or four copies because for example, court four, Harris County Probate Court four requires, um, well, he prefers, excuse me, a paper copy for his court reporter, a paper copy for him. And then of course you're gonna need one for opposing counsel or if they have co-counsel, two chairs, and then you'll want one for yourself and then possibly for the client or if you have co-counsel. So you're looking at probably six binders, maybe seven or eight binders. So, and that's a lot of printing. So I recommend the deadlines in your pretrial being way ahead of time also because of the print jobs you might end up having to do. <laughs> and I've sent out print jobs depending on the production and things I've had to print. I've also done it in-house. Um, it just depends on how many pages you're printing. Also for the deposition testimony designations, um, I did, I like to do a longer deadline between that and counter designations usually because you'll need time to review the whole transcript because um, of the optional completeness. You'll wanna make sure that things aren't taken out of context um, testimony wise. So there might be also other things than just a deposition transcript you're reviewing to figure out how you're gonna respond to this designated testimony. So when you review the testimony that they've designated, you look through it and you're like, okay, well, what can I, what can I present to refute this or kind of present our side of the story? You would look at those deposition transcripts, the full thing. You would also look at other witnesses, deposition transcripts, and you would look at your documentary evidence. Or if you have a live witness that's going to be there that can refute it, you might want to designate, not, at least to yourself internally in your, in your list of your proof, you might want to list, this is what's going to refute that, that deposition excerpt. Um, as far as written objections to proposed jury charge instructions and definitions, it's very, I recommend doing written objections. It is not required for preservation of error. However, if your oral objection is not specific in fact and law, you can actually fail to preserve error. So I always include the written objections in my pretrial deadlines because if you have time, you should do written objections. 
you shouldn't be doing it orally on the fly in court because there's a chance that you'll mess up or miss something. And um, you don't want to be in that position when getting the transcript after the fact on your appeal and being like, well, I didn't really say it how I thought I did. Um, even if it means you have a jury charge conference and it ends and the next day you're coming back and maybe they've already ruled. If you have time that night, whip it out and file it because it's at least better. And then you can say the next day, you can come to court and say, judge, I know you ruled, but I also uh, filed written objections just to clear up the record about what my objections were for the jury charge. Um, I'd happily address them now, or I can just um, let the briefing apply and, and the court can consider them. Um, that you, is sometimes frowned upon, um, but I would rather do it and have it in the record than not have it in the record. Mm -hmm. um, also, for motions in limine, Harris County and Fort Bend, some of them have form limine orders. So they're standard um, limine language some of the courts use. For example, counsel, bad mouthing other counsel. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. Or um, talking about insurance, talking about someone's wealth or net worth. Um, there's a number of just standard limine orders. And Texas O'Connor's has a pretty good form as well, but depending on what area of law you're in, those might not apply. So for example, in probate um, and in guardianships, we get to talk about criminal um, convictions um, for felonies and crimes of moral turpitude because those do affect whether somebody can qualify uh, as a fiduciary. So um, those are things that will probably be deleted out of the um, standard limine order for those type of cases. Also, when you're looking at incapacity or undue influence, the dead man's rule comes into effect. So again, you might wanna address the dead man's rule in your limine order to limit what testimony can come in unless it's corroborated by someone else so that you have it in the limine order hold up dead man's rule, is it corroborated? And you can kind of preemptively have that in place during the trial because it's going to be an issue. It also reminds you that you don't waive it during trial. Because if you ask questions that uh, um, the response is what the, what, if you asked a question during trial, what did the decedent say? You're waiving it because you're asking them directly to violate the rules. So um, by keeping it in your limine order, your it's a checking system for yourself as well. So I actually have it in my standard motion and order um, for some of my cases. If there's going to be a decedent or if someone's going to try to talk about what a dead person said, um, because it reminds me when I'm trying to put my de my de my testimony questions in place. So also uh, written objections to trial exhibits and witness lists. So again, I, I think it's better to do written objections, but again, you can do it orally, but by doing your written objections, it's just to clear a record. Also, the timing of discovery is very important. So I did a little chart. Um, <laughs> so a long time ago, well, not that long ago, because when I was practicing, uh, early on, I could we could all serve written discovery with our initial petition, but now we can't do that. So um, as far as timing goes, there are some courts that are setting trials um, a little bit too early because when you're looking at when discovery starts, it's it's 30 days after the answer is due. So that's 50 days out after a petition is filed. Well, there are certain counties um, that may be setting trials three to four months out. Well, that means that you're looking at only a few, like a month and a half of discovery being done. Who's gonna be ready for trial after a month and a half of discovery? Hardly anyone. So, and um, so I would look as soon as you get in the case, if there's already a trial set, you need to kind of look at how much time you have from when you're, you appeared to when discovery expires. Because if you see right there, it's going to be like less than 60 days 
you're probably going to need a trial continuance if it's a complex case. Maybe if it's a divorce case, maybe not. But if maybe if it's a very simple divorce case, but if you're talking about a high net worth people and you're going to have to do a lot of investigation regarding finances and people are hiding stuff, less than 60 days is not a lot of time. So look at that and do a trial continuance earlier on because if you don't have the discovery time to get your evidence together for trial prep, you don't want to be in the 10th hour asking for a trial continuance. And the, a lot of these courts are getting pressure from the Supreme Court on the age of the cases on their docket. So they're under a pressure. They want those cases off their docket as soon as possible. And if they're aged, they're putting the pressure on not to have continuances. So if you early on are managing the court's expectations regarding you know, Judge, we only have we have 45 days to do discovery. We just came in here. We only have 45 days to do discovery to get ready for trial. It needs to be moved out. Do it early on and also move the discovery expiration out too, so that you have time to prepare for trial. I've also included 90 days before the expiration of discovery as a key time to start getting ready for trial because. Okay. 90 days out seems like a lot, but it's really not because <laughs> you'll you'll probably have other things going on. And typically uh, with most cases, I'd say that people might still be doing depositions at that time <laughs> or they haven't done depositions because they're trying to save money. So review your discovery, evaluate the need to supplement, confer and file motions to compel discovery from the opposing parties if there's oil plate objections or they only produce like five pages. Um, also evaluate whatever discovery you need, written discovery, and review your authenticated records. So and I, I practice wise, as soon as I get a response to a subpoena, I look at the business record affidavit. I look at the deposition of written questions to make sure they comply with um, Texas Rule of Evidence 902. And if it doesn't, I immediately, if we have a subpoena service, I ping the subpoena service and I say, you need to get back with the, the, the deponent, um, with the non-party to let them know that this isn't gonna work. If it's yeah. deficient, it needs to be fixed. And then I calendar it or I ask my, my my legal assistant calendar, I calendar it to remember to go back to the subpoena service to make sure I make sure that I get that. I also have a subpoena chart I keep where I've indicated in the subpoena chart, we've received the records, problems with the authentication, <laughs> followed back up. Um, you wanna check that. I say 90 days out at least, because you're going to need time to get those affidavits or those deposition of written questions. And then you have to follow them with the court under the rules ahead of time for the trial. So if you're doing that right before trial, it's possible you might not be able to get it in time. So 90 days out, best case practice is doing it when you receive them, but sometimes you don't have time to do that. At 60 days out is I would request any rulings on um, motions to compel, objections, privileges. I would also, at this point, confer with the opposing party, even though we have an obligation under the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, and we shouldn't have to tell another party or counsel, hey, your discovery responses are complete, right? <laughs> I always send a letter. That way, if they try to pop a rabbit out of the hat that they've hidden, um, later, I can actually be like, I sent you a letter on this day. When did you get this? Um, and I can question the party about it if we put them on the stand to get it excluded because um, sadly, there are discovery games played. So I paper as I go for trial to make sure that we're putting them in the hot seat for being accountable for meeting those deadlines because some judges will exclude the evidence when you get to trial, some. Others may not. So um, don't rely on that as far as exclude them. Someone not timely disclosing as a, oh, we got it, we're gonna win this case because I've seen it because judges are lawyers. They are sympathetic to other lawyers, not to, to them missing something. So um, they sometimes let it slide. Also, 
The 30 day before expiration of discovery, you request supplementation of production again. And I've identified two that I know that are usually not fully produced right before trial. That's attorney fee invoices and medical and treatment records. So if it's an ongoing PI case and the person is um, getting active treatment, then those are going to be records you're going to have to ask for them to supplement because you know you're not going to have them because they're still getting, well, if it's say for a back injury, <laughs> they're still going to the chiropractor every week. So you're going to need that. Um, also, the attorney fee invoices. I, if it's a case that you can get attorney's fees, I set a schedule, a reminder on our calendars that we need to supplement if I'm the person seeking the attorney's fees. Because obviously you can't produce something when the invoice hasn't been posted. So we just do it every couple of months. I don't do it every month necessarily. It just depends on the case. Um, 20 days before trial, I recommend producing all. And this is because I find it easier for myself to look at production in binders at trial. I also have them on PDF on my computer during trial. But it's quicker to pull something up. If someone's trying to present evidence that they didn't have in their exhibit list and it's Bates Lambert, if I have it in a binder, I can quickly flip it to the page that they're referring to and, and see if it if what they're saying is what was actually produced. And so I can follow along in trial. So I like to print one to two copies, have it in binders. I have it on a USB or external hard drive and on my laptop so that I can control F2. So I OCR all my production if I can. If you have space to do that on your computer for trial, I recommend having any evidence from the other side or yourself, any production and pleadings OCR'd um, so that you can control off and look for something very quickly. Because um, I've been there trying to like look on the paper or scramble around and it's already moved on. So um, I have a folder on my desktop usually for that. I do that for hearings as well, not just for trial. So I can control F. And if they're saying they allege something in their petition, for example, at trial, because they're trying to bring something in that wasn't, that isn't a claim or a defense, I could control F and really look in their live pleadings and be like, judge, it's not in there. I object, it's outside the pleadings. Um, also, depending on the type of case, I separate the production for each. So I'll do the full production and the Bates labeled, well, preferably it would be Bates labeled, but sometimes it's not. So I do it by date. So if it's not Bates labeled, I actually have my production internally on my computer and on our system separated by the date it was produced. So I'll have like a colored sheet or a cover sheet in between each production batch and it'll identify the date it was produced. So if we are disputing other side is trying to use something. We're like, whoa, whoa, this wasn't produced. When did, and they say, no, it was. Well, when was it produced? And then I could look at the dates from when things were produced because sometimes people may not base label their production. They just throw some papers at you. And uh, in the ordinary course of business as it's been kept in the ordinary course of business and you won't be able to find it. So um, quick ways to check it. Also, um, I separate if there's production related to certain damages, I'll have them in binders as well um, myself so I can quickly look up for each element, um, particularly damages um, for me and capacity for certain cases. For claims and defenses, I recommend for trial prep early on, looking at the Texas pattern jury charge you can buy it. Also, the law library here has the Texas pattern jury charges, the most current ones. They have an electronic version. They also have the paper version. I prefer the electronic, control F, very easy. <laughs> uh, click on the hyperlinks in it um, and it'll lead you to where you need to go. But look and see if you're bringing a case and you are a baby lawyer, a pro se person, you're going to look at that because you need to know what your proof is and what questions are going to be asked to the jury or what questions the bench is considering. Um, so each element, each question. So look at that, kind of have an idea. Also look at the burden of proof, whether it's shifting, whether there's a presumption, um, because 
like with fiduciaries, if there's self-dealing and there's, if, if I am suing a fiduciary and I prove that there's been a transaction between the fiduciary and say the principal under a power of attorney, the burden shifts to the fiduciary to prove that it's fair. So there, there are things that, it, that there's complexities with different claims that you need to know about. And by looking at the Texas pattern jury charge, you'll be able to look at the commentary and the questions and see what you have to prove. Helps with discovery too. Also, when you're getting ready for trial, you need to think about election of remedies. So if you have 10 claims for the same damages, you're gonna have to figure out which one you're gonna go with. Now, obviously you don't have to make that election until after the trial, because um, if you only get judgment on one, there really isn't a choice. <laughs> but if you get judgment on multiples, you're gonna wanna look at which ones you can get fees for. So my election of remedies usually is which one gets fees. And then if there's multiple ones that you can get fees, I then look at it and see which one had more solid evidence, which one uh, doesn't have as many fact issues, if you will, um, like fraud. Um, also with election of remedies, if you're dealing with a defendant that might be judgment proof or um, be filing for bankruptcy, you also wanna consider which claims that you um, got a judgment on cannot be extinguished in bankruptcy. So that's another thing to think about when you're doing your election of remedies. If you're dealing with bankruptcy, you want to know what, what can't be extinguished. Um, also, when you're going to trial, I recommend narrowing your claims and defenses. Some people want to throw the kitchen sink in there. Um, I don't because it frustrates the jury. I've, I've been in two, three week jury trials. And by the end, they're mad at everyone for having to have been there so long. So I recommend narrowing it. <laughs> Sometimes you can't, um, but if you can, narrow your claims, don't throw the kitchen sink in, especially if some of them are weak, get rid of the weak ones. Um, we don't need a 40 page uh, jury questions because <laughs> um, we're gonna be there a while. So some counties and some courts do joint pretrial orders. Um, there's some courts here in Fort Bend that do it. There's a lot of courts in Harris County that do it. So what they're trying to encourage is counsel to come together or maybe the pro se litigant and counsel and get together a joint pretrial order that includes all the things that are under the pretrial deadlines so that we've conferred before we even walk into court. Um, doesn't really go really well, typically in practice, if you're dealing with a not pleasant opposing counsel or pro se party, you're doing it by yourself. And so it's supposed to be a joint pretrial order, but what happens is you're doing it separately. <laughs> um, so I, I, I would say that, um, it, it's a good idea to start on that early. Um, you can get a paralegal or legal assistant to help with some of the sections, like the appearance of counsel is a section. They want the contact information for all the attorneys or the pro se parties so that if somebody doesn't show up or if they don't come back from a break, the court has their contact information. It has a statement of the case. Any pending motions when we're going into pretrial might be an expert in motion to strike or exclude expert testimony. Um, contention of the parties, amendments to the pleadings, admissions of fact, I have the whole list on there, but um, settlement, you'll wanna usually, the section on settlement, I put, for example, most of the time in my DCOs, we do require mediation and most of the courts order mediation. So I say the parties went to mediation, but it didn't settle. <laughs> I didn't reach settlement. Um, that's I don't put details of the settlement because that can be confidential. I don't put details of what was exchanged under that section. Some attorneys may, um, since it's confidential and what's done at mediation, stay at mediation, shouldn't talk about it or file in the record. I don't include that. I also plan and I attach to the joint pretrial order the exhibits, witness list, instructions, jury charge, 
anything that I can of the pretrial materials that have already been done, I attach it to my joint pretrial order and I'll even PDF it and do electronic bookmarks because the courts like um, it being easy for them to get through it. So the, the more likely to go with your joint pretrial order than they will with opposing counsel if you if you put it in a way that's easier for them to use like electronic bookmarks. Um, but most courts, at least in Harris County, do require you to send a Word document of that so they can modify it. So um, I would also check back on the procedures and whatnot. Exhibits. So I use electronic exhibit stickers on all my exhibits. Some courts require paper stickers. Yeah. So I'm actually, so because of our Zoom connection, I have to stop this Zoom connection and I'm gonna connect onto another link. So uh, that has been sent out. So I wanted to warn everyone that I'm going to stop the share, jump on the second link and I'll be back shortly. And hopefully you guys will join that. I'm not boring you. So hopefully you'll come back. Two minutes. We are back from our little break. Um, thank you guys for your patience. I am going to share my presentation now so we can um, so that we can get through this today. Um, I was on exhibits. So I use electronic stickers ahead of time typically or during trial, but for those judges or courts that like the paper documents, same with the court reporters, they're gonna want actual stickers. And the court reporter might actually have her own stickers with the little blanks to put plaintiff or defendant or names or whatnot. So I would, again, ask the court, or um, the clerk regarding what their preferences are if it's not on the website so that you don't make the mistake of marking them ahead of time and then having to put a sticker over it. Um, for those of you that did Zoom trials, um, like I did, you, it was easy to use electronic stickers because you're dropping in the chat box <laughs> and you could mark them as you went. Um, if you don't have electronic stickers in your Adobe DC or professional, let me know, I have an add-on that I can share that I got um, that you can download and you'll have exhibit stickers so you can modify them. It's also great because it's built in when you go to do your next one, it'll actually show you what the last number was. So um, very helpful. Also have your exhibits a hard copy, even if the judge is an electronic person and electronic, I do both so that I can pull it up. I'm not rustling papers during trial. I can be looking on an iPad or I can be looking at it on my computer. On the same line, do a tech, a tech check in the courtroom, arrange it ahead of time. I did that for the presentation today. Um, you never know, especially if you're using a Mac and you're gonna have problems. So if you're planning to use your computer and you're gonna do a demonstrative or video or some audio or zoom in to a document, make sure that your tech is gonna work with the courtroom you're going to. And um, it's good to do that as well because some of the courtrooms have the huge monitors by the jury, then the judge has their own monitor and they're following it along with the, with everyone. So you, and there might even be one on the witness stand depending on the county. Um, here in Fort Bend, if you have a PC, super easy. You just plug in a USB and there's a clicking button for click share. Um, they have like little papers in the courtroom um, and, and they do have them in the law library about how to use click share. Harris County is not that advanced. So if you end up in Harris County, they don't, they have advanced their technology, but they're not at click share yet. So um, you have to make sure you bring the correct adapters to plug into the computers there. So I recommend bringing like a universal adapter with like HDMI, USB and other things so that you're prepared to use it. And also 
you want to make sure it's long. So I recommend having six to eight foot long cord for those type of things when you're connecting in a courtroom, because you don't know how far from your, the desk your computer is going to be to the to the um, actual tower, because there's usually a tower under the desk for that type of thing, if they're a smaller county who doesn't have good tech. Um, or I should say, uh, have not advanced in technology in the last few years. So do that ahead of time. And they're really cool about it. Most of the time, the court coordinator will tell you when to come. Or if you have a hearing, I'll go. And if my hearing's the last one for that day, I say, hey, can I stay a little late and check my stuff? And they'll, they'll let you do it. Also, unless it's lunchtime, and then don't be that person. Um, demonstratives. Um, for demonstrative exhibits, I do use some. I typically use them for fees um, or timelines sometimes, or if there's an abundance of testimony, I might use it that to summarize the testimony, like maybe an expert. Um, but if you can, you need to produce it ahead of time. Um, also, because of the cases I cited in my paper in the materials, do not necessarily have it admitted as evidence. I'd be very careful with that. Ask if you can use it, it's helpful, it's to avoid confusion. Maybe not have it admitted as evidence. Um, it just depends. I have my demonstrative for my fees admitted as evidence typically, and I produce it ahead of time. Um, it'll exclude my estimated fees of what it might be for, for trial and what prep from when I produced it but it'll have everything else with a breakdown. I actually have a slide with that on there. Foundation. So I also covered this in my materials, uh, but I'm being more practical with how I'm presenting in the PowerPoint. You want to identify which witness will authenticate what evidence. So in my exhibit, I have an internal privileged exhibit list that I've included in the materials. You want to identify what witness is going to authenticate it. If there's going to be someone that gets on the stand who's going to lay down the foundation, you want to identify who it is. And if you have more than one, have a backup. Because what if that person doesn't make a good witness and you're worried about the jury not liking them or not finding credible, have a backup person. So identify what witnesses will authenticate it. So if it's photographs, for example, who took the photographs, when would they use to take the photograph? Um, if it's a custodian of record, because you didn't get a business record or a deposition of written questions, are they the person who could do that? Are they a custodian of records? Do they have a title? What is their title? Um, include that in your chart. Also, I prefer doing a business records and deposition of written questions to have that as a backup. I don't like doing oral testimony to prove up documents because it's kind of boring and it wastes the jury's time when we can have um, it authenticated by the documents authenticated by a business record or a DWQ. And you'll have that already done. And there's you don't have to worry about, well, did I ask the correct questions that properly laid the foundation for that to be authenticated and admissible? Well, at least in regard to the business record affidavit and deposition or questions, you'll know you've met your authentication if it complies with the Texas rules of evidence. As for, unless trustworthiness is questioned. <laughs> um, for pre-admission, I recommend doing pre-admission of evidence before the trial starts at the pre-trial conference or right after we're dire. And the reason why is I hate coming to trial and having the evidence fight and the jury is sitting there. They're not in the courtroom, but they're sitting and they're like, well, what's going on? Why are we sitting here? Um, they're not going to find out why they were sitting there. Typically, they're just sitting back there and they're like making six, eight dollars today for me to sit here. Like, are we going to get this ready? Like, is this going to be how long is this going to be? I would like to get back to work and make some money. Uh, or I'm taking a vacation day or whatever. I mean, it's just better to have pre-admission of the evidence before trial starts at the pre-trial conference or right before retire so that that's done. And you guys can confer, counsel can confer and agree. And I usually do that. Like we, we agree some things are admissible um, and at least leave the stuff that isn't pre-admitted to fight later. 
that's better than saving everything at once. But you are limited by what the court wants to do and what they're willing to do. So try, but if the court is going to do what it's going to do, yes, Your Honor, <laughs> and move on. Um, but the, typically most of them like to pre-admit because it, it makes it easier and there's less interruptions. And they want the jury to be, courts are very respectful jurors' times, uh, their time, and, the, and they thank them usually after after the trial's done. So they also like to, to save their time that they're sitting back there not doing anything and wondering what's going on. For a foundation, your three things that are important, that uh, three steps, if you will, and it's is authentication, admissibility, and relevancy. Um, for relevance, if you're arguing about that, I'd say that's a Hail Mary, because <laughs> most of the time um, things are relevant, at least in my cases. I have messy family situations, undue influence, fraud, and things like that. So the totality of these circumstances might be in play in the cases I'm trying. Um, but for authentication and admissibility, those are important. And you can anticipate sometimes what arguments are going to be about your evidence you want to bring. So in the chart that I've included for the privilege exhibit list, I have columns for you're anticipating what they're going to argue and you know what your response is going to be. For example, they can say it's hearsay. Well, judge, there's an exception. It's an excited utterance or whatever it may be. That way you have it ready. So you know, you anticipate what the objections are going to be from the other side and you have a response so the court can make a decision on whether that's going to be admitted or not. For witnesses, I have two categories and this is not covered by my materials. <laughs> friendly versus other or hostile. So obviously if they're a friendly witness, you're thinking, well, I don't have to subpoena them because they said they're going to be there, right? Always subpoena them. I've been burned. If they say they're going to be there, then they'll be willing to accept a subpoena and sign the acceptance for the subpoena. And then you have a binding document that will be subject to contempt and you can compel them. If you depend on the witness saying they're going to be there and don't subpoena them, then you have no remedy from they're not coming. And also, it looks like you haven't done your due diligence to have your witness be there. So securing a continuance is going to be a problem. Um, and if it's denied, you do a continuance and it's denied, you haven't preserved your rights um, as far as denial of a continuance or abuse of discretion when you take it up on appeal. So subpoena them. And if they're a friendly witness, I've zelled the witness fee. I've said, hey, here's the, I've sent it by Adobe, the subpoena. I have them sign electronically for the acceptance of the subpoena and I zell them, wire them, electronically send them the witness fee. And as part of the acceptance, I have a little space where they admit they got the witness fee and how they got it, like via zell or whatever it may be. That way I've teed it up. So if they don't show up, judge, I subpoenaed them, they accepted it, here it is going to have to do a motion to compel, going to have to do a motion for contempt. We need a continuance, whatever it may be, you're teed it up so you actually have a remedy. Also, I recommend writing separately. Here's why. When you're writing with a witness to the courthouse, there's a possibility you're going to be seen by opposing counsel or another party. And that's going to be asked, who'd you ride with today? Because I asked that. I asked that in depositions. I asked that at trial. How'd you get here today? Who'd you ride with? And if the witness is riding with a party that it may look biased, that looks bad. It looks really bad. It's It just has bad optics. So I don't recommend them riding together. Now, if the person is elderly, that's a different reason. Maybe they're disabled. They need somebody to help them. That's a completely different scenario. But if they have no reason why they can't drive themselves, they need to drive themselves. <laughs> at least that's how I practice. Also, when you get to the courthouse, minimal contact prior, if they're friendly, you don't want the jury to see um, the witnesses hanging out, talking to the party, being buddy-buddy, hugging them, high-fiving, texting, whatever. It's just better that the witnesses stay away from, they stay away from each other. Now, if they're spouses, 
or family, close family, that's understandable. But if we're talking about, like in my cases, it's a drafting attorney, it's the attorney who drafted the will, it's an issue that's being contested, that person shouldn't even come near one of the contestants in the will and give them a hug or stand by them and be having conversation before the case. It just looks bad. Also, you'll want to research the bases for bias. So when you're looking at the friendly witnesses, you might want to have like a list of things that they're going to try to impeach them or discredit them um, before the jury. For other hostile witnesses, be prepared to deal with evasion of service. So I recommend uh, provide, because usually what happens is you're not going to know when your trial is going to be. You get called to the docket. You're thinking either you keep calling, you're like, am I 10th on the docket? And then all these cases settle. And next thing you know, I'm going to trial. I thought it was going to be like in three weeks, but it's going. So you have a short window to get that uh, subpoena out. So be prepared to have them serve for them to evade. So provide them with a recent picture. So if you can get on social media or pull a professional picture of the person, give them the cell number of the witness, known locations where the witness can be found, where they last lived, maybe their car, if you know what kind of car they drive, what color, give all that to the process server because um, they're going to have to hunt them down. I've had evasion. I have a process server that I use who's pretty good. He has outfits. He has a lottery outfit. <laughs> he has a Texas lottery outfit he puts on. He, he has a lawn chair in his trunk. He will post out outside a business by the dumpster um, to serve people. Um, you have to pay them by the hour, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. So um, I would say find a good a good uh, process server. And if you know they're going to evade, give them as much information as you can, because getting those subpoenas served for trial is really important. Also, be prepared to ask for contempt. So if you're going to ask for contempt, you have to have the um, return on file. You have to have proof that the witness fee was paid. You have to have proof that for the return, I also file the subpoena itself so that I prove that it complies with the rules um, regarding what it includes. So have that all on the record so that if you show up and the witness doesn't show up, the court can look in the court record and be like, yep, you're right, you've done it, here we go. Um, if they fail um, to come, also be prepared to ask for a continuance. Now, continuances have to be in writing and verified, but you can say, judge, gonna have to file a continuance and you can tell them when you're gonna get it on file. And the court can tell you when they're gonna require it to be on file. So you can run home and or to the office across the street and whip it out and get it on file. Also for the charge conference, it depends on what jurisdiction you're in, um, but here in Fort Bend, it also depends on what judge you're with. So the timing might be you might do the charge conference before or after we're dire or during trial. Now, some judges like to do it during trial because the evidence is going to govern what's going to be in the jury charge. If we're looking at there's going to be a directed verdict on some of these claims, there's not enough evidence or the testimony. Say you came in and your testimony that you had was going to prove up this. And when the witness got on the stand, that's not what happened. You only proved up a couple things not three claims, then you're looking at a smaller charge. So they might wanna do it during trial. My recommendation and my preference is not during trial because again, it frustrates the jury. They're not in the courtroom while you're during the jury charge. I had one where we did a jury charge conference for three days in the middle of trial. And the jury, when they came back in, were killing us with their eyes because they were wondering what the heck was going on for those three days while we're sitting in the we're sitting in that in the other room with no tv we can have our electronics but can't use them um so i recommend not doing it during trial if you can get it done before ask the court to do that again the court rules on how it's done so you can request it but if it's denied don't push it also, I do all my written objections, like I said before. I try not to do oral objections because you won't, you have a better chance of not preserving error if you do it orally than you do if it's written. 
Also, Texas Powder and Jury Charge, the way I do my jury charge is I do footnotes saying where it came from in the jury charge. So there is case law. It is not required to use the jury charge. However, the jury charge is broadly construed. It's promulgated by the Texas Supreme Court. It's also done by professional attorneys. Almost all courts accept the jury charge. Um, if you use it, typically there's less chance that there's going to be an error on appeal related to the jury charge. There are things that are not covered by the jury charge, like I'll give you an example, defalcation. Um, it is a, a fiduciary duty claim um, that is not dischargeable in bankruptcy. There is not a jury charge for that. So you'll have to draft that from scratch. I've done it. So there'll be claims out there that aren't covered, but if they are, use the jury charge, use footnotes so that the other side and the court can check that it's complying with the newest Texas pattern jury charge. Also, if it is a case where people can afford to do it, the charge conference might be where you have appellate counsel. Or if you're a larger firm and you have different divisions and you have an experienced appellate lawyer at the firm, have the appellate lawyer be there for when the evidence uh, objections are dealt with and when the charge conference happens, because those are the times where there might be waiver of error. So having that experienced person there and they're not actually arguing it, they're just kind of sitting there and they might pass the post-it to the person who is arguing it to let them know like, hey, you're missing something uh, might be helpful. If not, I mean, I've seen lots of them where they're, they're not, not there, but if we're talking like a billion dollar case, it makes sense why you would have appellate counsel at the table. Here is an example of a jury charge, how I do it. Um, I didn't fill in the bracket, but you'll see I, I put a footnote after the question and then I do a footnote for as far as you can so I've seen it done both ways, which is why I did this. So you can do TEX, PJC, and then the number, or you can do Texas pattern jury charge and then the number. But either way, I recommend doing that because everybody can check, are they actually following the jury charge um, that's been promulgated by the Supreme Court? Offer of proof. So uh, getting ready for trial, I recommend having an offer of proof ready for certain things where you think there might be a problem with getting the evidence or testimony admitted. So, it, and my outlines are usually like bullet points at shorthand, it's not the full outline, but that's why I recommend doing the pre-admission because if you do the pre-admission of evidence, you've narrowed down what evidence is at issue and being objected to. So then you can identify, okay, well, we're gonna have problems with like five exhibits and you can, then do an outline for the offer of proof on those five exhibits so that you know you're ready. Also, the case law and the text rules of civil procedure require that the offer of proof happen as soon as practical and before reading the charge to the jury. So if testimony or evidence is excluded by the court, you need to ask for that offer of proof as soon as possible and make sure it's before they read the jury charge. Also, it's typically done in a Q&A fashion to lay the foundation and how I've seen it done. I've, I've actually only seen an offer of proof done related to expert testimony usually. Um, <laughs> I haven't used it for anything else because um, usually you can find another witness or another way to get something in. A chart or a shorthand um, list of things is I include evidentiary objections. I have a little chart I always bring with me uh, to trial or any um, hearing, like a summary judgment hearing. Also do have a, if we have lemony orders, I have that readily and I have like a bullet list of like little lemony um, limitations so that I can run up to the bench <laughs> with my list and we can hash it out. With the limiting order violations, of course, you have to be very careful with that as far as calling it out because a lot of some counsel like to violate it because it looks bad that you're running up to the judge, to the jury all the time. So <laughs> uh, it's just a, it's a balance. 
Also, I have a shorthand list or a chart of limiting instructions for the jury. So if I know, for example, that the other side is going to bring up a criminal conviction, a gambling problem, something that's in the limiting order, um, they're going to they're going to completely violate it and double down on it. Then I have a list of a request for limiting instructions for the jury related to that because it's pretty important. Um, to be ready to do that because you don't have time to go check your book um, during trial. Also demonstrative, here is my attorney fee chart uh, that I was talking about. I do, I break it out. This is one where I was like separating what was, segre what was segregated and what was not. And I discounted it and I separated by staff and who they were and whatnot. Here are some practice tips that I've included regarding um, laptop, iPad, phone chargers, things to bring with you, um, food. Um, one partner that I used to work for would always bring a pre B and J to trial with him when we went to trial. And he, he he wanted you to bring it with you as well so that you could sit there during the breaks and during lunch and uh, hash out and work on the things that you need to do. So I actually do something similar now, not always a PB and J. Also coffee, uh, Fort Bend uh, County Courthouse doesn't have a coffee shop. So maybe bring some instant coffee. If you are a person uh, are gonna be here early and you're pulling all nighters or doing late nights for trial, have some of that. If you are from out of town or you're going to a place where it's further and you're worried about the commute, getting a flat tire, you might think about staying near um, where the trial's happening. I've done that where it's like, it's gonna be like an hour drive. I'm not gonna risk it. Also, pick a home base during uh, the trial where you're going to go and make sure where you're going to go and convene during uh, breaks because you don't want the other side to hear you, what you're talking about. Uh, the law library is a good place to do that here in Fort Bend. Also, if you're going to use audio and video, again, test that out. Make sure it works. Have backups. And that's it. So if anybody has any questions, let me know. I've included my contact information in the presentation. Thank you. I appreciate it. And hey, we just want to say thank you again to Andrea. You know, I've been out of practice a little while since I became a law librarian, and it brings to memory all the things you got to do to get your ducks in a row for trial, let alone dealing with the tech and just everything else. So it's a really good reminder of just everything that goes into bringing a competent trial and having what you need just to, before we even get to talking about the evidence and questioning the witnesses, everything you got to do beforehand. Uh, so very impressive and very helpful. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you all for attending the class. Everything.